The Custom of the Country by Edith Wharton. Dramatised for radio by Jane Rogers. I first clapped eyes on the beautiful Undine Sprague when she and her parents were no more in a few weeks in New York City. I could have told you then that girl would go far. And go far she surely did. I got the newspaper clippings here to prove it. Now then, Mrs. Sprague, shall I buff your nails before I go? Well, why not? I swear I haven't seen a human being all day, Mrs. Heaney. I don't know who this note can be from. Give. Oh, Undine Sprague, how can you? If it's an invite, I guess it's meant for me, Mother. Did you ever, Mrs. Heaney? I never met with a lovelier form. Here, you can have it after all. Why, isn't it from Mr. Popple? No. What made you think I thought it would be? Undie's friend Mabel introduced him to her last night. And from something Mr. Popple said to her about going to one of the new plays, she thought... How on earth do you know what I thought? Well, you said you thought... Claude Popple, the portrait painter? Yes, I suppose so. He said he'd like to paint me. I don't care if I never see him again. Do you know him, Mrs. Heaney? I should say I did. I manicured him for his first society portrait. I know everybody. If they don't know me, they ain't in it. And Claude Popple's in it. But who is your invite from? A little quiet fellow who was tagging along with Mr. Popple. He said his name was Ralph. <gasps> Ralph Marvell? Well, I declare. You know the Marvells? Are they stylish? Why, Undine Sprague, if they ain't swell enough for you, you'd better go right over to the Court of England. Give me that note, Mother. His sister wants me to dine with her next Wednesday. Why does she want me? She's never even seen me. Oh, Marvell's sister gives the smartest dinners in town. There was an account of one she gave last week in this morning's town talk. Oh, I guess it's right here among my clippings. Oh, here. Mrs. Laura Fairford gave another of her natty little dinners last Wednesday. As usual, it was smart and exclusive, and there was much gnashing of teeth among the left out. Do you know Mrs. Fairford, too? I massaged her for a sprained ankle a couple of years ago. She's got a lovely manner, but no conversation. It is written to Mother, Mrs. Abner E. Sprague. Will you allow your daughter to dine with me? Allow... Is Mrs. Fairford peculiar? Don't you know it's the thing in the best society to pretend that girls can't do anything without their mother's permission? Mercy! But how will mother know what to say? She'll say what you tell her to, of course. You better tell her you want to dine with Mrs. Fairford. Have I got to write the note, then? No, I guess Undine can write it as if it was from you. Mrs. Fairford, they'll know you're writing. I'll go and do it now. I do hope she'll quiet down now. Undine. Yes. She seems so set on that Mr. Popple calling. She's so lonesome, poor child. I can't say as I blame her. No, he'll call. A girl that lovely, they'll all be calling. Falling over themselves to meet the girl from Apex. They say New Yorkers are always in a hurry. But I can't say as they've hurried much to make our acquaintance. You wait, Mrs. Sprague. You wait. The wrong set's like flypaper. Once you're in it, you can pull and pull, but you never get out again. I wish you'd tell Undie that, Mrs. Heaney. Undine's all right. And if young Marvell's really taken with her, she'll have the run of the place in no time. Undine's got an invite from one of the gentlemen Mabel Lipscomb introduced her to last night. Oh, yeah? You see, we were right to come here, Abner. I guess you two always manage to be right. What's the matter? Nothing worse than what I can see to. Has the deal gone bad? You and Undy got to go steady for a while. The market's a little shaky. I saw Elma Moffat downtown today. Oh, Abner! What's the good of oh, Abner in? Elma Moffat's nothing to us. No more than if we never sell eyes on him. I know it, but but what's he doing here? Did you speak to him? No. I guess Elmer and I pretty well talked out. Well, don't you tell Andy that you saw him. She may meet him herself. Well, don't tell her anyhow. He can't do anything to her, can he? Do anything? I'd like to see him touch her. I'd give him a... Father, I've been invited out to dinner, but I haven't got a single thing to wear. Undine, I wouldn't ask Father to buy any more clothes right on top of those last bills. I ain't on top of those last bills yet. I'm way down under them. Oh, well, if you want me to look like a scarecrow and not get asked again, I've got a dress that'll do perfectly. Well, that kind of dress might come in mighty handy on some occasions. So I guess you better hold on to it for future use. Go on. 
Go and select yourself another for this precious dinner. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Andy? Mother, what on earth are you waiting up for? I just had to, Wendy. I told Father I had to. I wanted to hear all about the fair for dinner. Mercy, at this hour, you'll be as white as a sheet tomorrow. Why, Andy, you're white. What's the matter? Can't you leave me alone? Didn't they receive you right? What nonsense? How should they receive me? Everybody was lovely to me. Would you like a sup of milk before you go to bed? I've got some ready for you. I want Father to take a box at the opera on Friday. For your new friends? For me. I shall go with Mabel Lipscomb. You and Father can come along as well. Oh, Andy, I don't know as I should care for... Nonsense! You can't hide away like an owl for the rest of your life. And girls here don't go out without their mothers. Just sit in front of the mirror and let me brush your hair. Oh, my, but you look fine. I can do it myself. Good night, Mother. Good night, then... Didn't they receive you right? To be sure they did, in their shabby little house full of books as the old circulating library with their plain food and dowdy clothes. Who was the best-dressed woman there, Undine Sprague? You. And all their boring talk about literature and exhibitions and the theatre, when not a one of them has read when the kissing had to stop. And there was me thinking Ralph would at the very least see me home, but... No, because he has to talk to Mrs. Van Dagen. Oh, Ralphie, dear, you have to come to the opera with me on Friday. We'll dine together first. Peter has a club dinner. Oh, Ralphie, dear. Oh, Cousin Claire. Tell me, who is better looking? You or Cousin Claire? There ain't none of them a patch on you. And so Undine dragged her loving parents to the opera. There's Mr. Popple just below, with that bulging-eyed gent. Mabel, Mother see him? The one with the eyeglass? He's fixed on you, my girl. Mother, don't lean out like that and make such an exhibition of yourself, for goodness sake. Try to show a little tone. But everybody's going about saying hello now the music stopped, Undine. There's Ralph Marvell over there. And that's Mrs. Van Dagen next to him. Don't stare. It's bright enough to hurt your eyes in here. Mabel, don't beckon like that. Other people aren't beckoning. I'm only being friendly. Well, if we aren't to go down, I shall just sit back in the corner there next to Father and rest my eyes a few seconds. You don't go down. They come to you. Mm. Oh, hello, Mr. Popple. Good evening, Miss Marvell, Mrs. Lipscomb. May I present Mr. Peter Van Dagen? I say, good evening. The loveliest apparition in the theatre. I told Pop he simply had to introduce us. <laughs> Good evening. Mr. Popple said he'd like to paint my portrait. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Lipscomb, I'm having a soiree on Friday. You do your hair rippingly. You must let me come and talk to you about it. <laughs> what? The picture of my hair? Your hair, if you don't mind. Where are you staying? Oh, I live in New York now. At the Stentorian. I say, first rate. You should come along to dinner at the Café Martin one night. It's a frightfully jolly crowd. That would be delightful. And I should be happy to see Mrs. Van Dagen again. My wife? <laughs> she doesn't go to restaurants. She moves on too high a plane. But we'll get old Pop and Mrs. Uh, what did you say your fat friend's name was? Lipscomb? Just a select little crowd of four. Some kind of cheerful show afterward. I'll drop you a line at your hotel. Oh, I say, hello, Ralph. I must ash. Mr. Marvell, I thought you weren't coming. Well, I waited till now on purpose to dodge your other visitors. Good evening, Mrs. Lipscomb. Oh, good evening. Oh, we hadn't so many. Oh, my hair. Oh, hang on. It's caught in the fastening of your necklace. Here, let me... There we are. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm so sorry. I haven't been introduced to your parents. <laughs> well, I won't introduce you now because they're both fast asleep. <laughs> The opera can seem long. <laughs> They've only come because I made them. They don't go out hardly at all. They don't know a soul in New York. Well, why did they leave Apex? They did it entirely on my account. But New York's not very friendly to strange girls, is it? I've seen girls here tonight that I just long to know. They look so lovely and refined. But I don't suppose I ever shall. Well, Mr. Van Dagen seems very friendly to you. I've never met him before in my life. He invited me to dinner at... 
Martin's, but then he said that wasn't grand enough for Mrs. Van Dagen. And I do wonder, if it isn't good enough for her, why does he suppose it's good enough for me? <laughs> I think you would be very wise to wonder that, Miss Sprague. But I hope to find you at home tomorrow. at the dressmakers, I'm afraid. I can't even tell you when she'll be back because she is so exacting. Ralph Marvell, I was at the opera last night. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, Mrs. Sprague. Oh, well, uh, take a seat, why don't you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Undine will be sore she missed you. She's in a terrible hurry to meet folk in New York. Sometimes I say to her, Undine, my girl, slow down. <laughs> Undine. That's such a wonderful name. How could you tell it would be such a fit? Why, we called her after a hair waver my father put on the market the week she was born. Oh. It's from Undoule, you know, the French for crimping. My father always thought the name made it take. He was quite a scholar and had the greatest knack for finding names. I remember the time he invented his Goliath glue. He sat up all night over the Bible to get the name. Oh, he was an inventor? Well, he was in the ministry, but that didn't pay. So finally, he opened a drugstore. And he did first rate at it, though his heart was always in the pulpit. But after he made such a success with his hair waver, he got to speculating in land out in Apex and somehow lost everything. <laughs> Even though Mr. Sprague did all he could. You met your husband in Apex. Oh, that's right. He always was a hard worker, but his family didn't have two beans to rub together. We were poor as mice when we wed. And then we had three little ones, three... Undine's brothers and sisters? They died. Two boys both died. The Lord spared us, Undine. I tell you, half the babies in Apex died that year in the typhoid epidemic. Oh, how dreadful. It was the water. Everyone said it was the water. And Mr. Sprague, he vowed on the graves of our babies that never again would folks as children have to drink tainted water. He'd taken over Father's land for a bad debt, and when he got up the pure water move, the company voted to buy the land and build a new reservoir up there. After that, we began to be better off, and it did seem as if it had come out so to comfort us some about the children. You must be very proud of your husband, Mrs. Sprague. Well, he's a businessman now, up there in the city with the best of them. <laughs> Ralph took to Mrs. Sprague, as well he might, there being no sham about her. She never set out to pretend the Spraggs were anything other than plain, ordinary folk, and he appreciated her frankness. He felt the same way about her daughter. Well, he felt a deal more about her daughter on account of her beauty. He shuddered to think of Peter Van Dagen and Popple turning her into some sort of cheap, fashionable female who'd simper and pretend to be ashamed of her good apex roots. A kind of vision come to him, that he would whirl down on his winged horse, swooping down and snatching her up from the nasty jaws of society to keep her innocent and true. And he even imagined, the poor boy, that this was the mission his life had been waiting for. And this is my grandfather, Mr. Dagonet. Grandfather, Miss Undine Sprague. Pleased to meet you, sir. Uh, they told me Ralph was marrying a beauty, but they didn't warn me I should be quite dazzled. <laughs> <laughs> May an old man lend you his arm and take you into dinner, my dear? <laughs> You know, Mother and I went to the German theater last night, Ralph. Of course you did. I'm sorry, Laura. I didn't even ask you. I've been so preoccupied. <laughs> Is it preoccupied, you call it? In my day, we wouldn't have been ashamed to admit to being head over heels. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, but a fellow shouldn't forget his sister, no matter what the provocation. <laughs> How was it, Laura? King Lear, wasn't it? Astonishing. We were both afraid our German wouldn't be up to it. But the intensity of the acting makes it more moving than any other performance I've seen. Have you been to the German theatre, Undine? I don't believe I have. I don't know as I should enjoy listening to them gabbling some foreign stuff all night long. How do you amuse yourself in New York, Miss Sprague? Do you have a wide acquaintance? Oh, I don't know many people yet. I tell Ralph he's got to take me round. You have a great friend in the lady who takes you into society, the lady who took you to the party where you met Ralph. Oh, yes, Mabel Lipscomb. We were schoolmates. Lipscomb? 
What is Mr. Lipscomb's occupation? He's a broker. A uh, broker. Well, Mr. Dagonet, I guess Mabel will get a divorce pretty soon. A divorce? Has he been misbehaving himself? Oh, I guess not. They like each other well enough, but he's been a disappointment to her. He isn't in the right set, and I think Mabel realizes she'll never really get anywhere till she gets rid of him. But, my dear young lady, what would your friend's own situation be if, as you put it, she got rid of her husband on so trivial a pretext? Well, that wouldn't be the reason given, of course. Any lawyer could fix it up for them. Don't they generally call it desertion? (laughs) Ralph, I believe in certain parts of the country such... Unfortunate arrangements are beginning to be tolerated. But in New York, a divorced woman is still, thank heaven, at a decided disadvantage. You mean to say Mabel would be worse off then? Couldn't she even go round as much as she does now? It would depend, I should say, on the kind of people she wished to see. Oh, the very best, of course. That would be her only object. <laughs> You see, Undine, you'd better think twice before you divorce me. (laughs) Ralph! Out in Apex, if a girl marries a man who don't come up to what she expected, people consider it's to her credit to want to change. You'd better think twice of that. If only I could be sure of knowing what you expect. Why? Everything. (laughs) My child, if you look like that, you'll get it. theater staring at us. Well, if you didn't want them to stare, you shouldn't look so lovely, should you, Laura? We shall be in all the papers tomorrow. Well, you don't have to read them, my dear. Ralph, there's Claire over there. I'm just going to say hello. You ought to go around and talk to your cousin. Have you told her we're engaged? Claire, of course. She's going to call on you tomorrow. She needn't put herself out. She's never been yet. Who's that you're waving to? Mr. Popple. You know he wants to paint me. Have you spoken to him recently? Oh, yes. I'd love to have him do me. Infernal Cheek is asking you to sit. But why? He's painted your cousin and all the smart women. Oh, well, if a smart portrait's all you want... I want what the others want. You do, don't you? Well, I'll go and say hello. Evening, Miss Sprague. <gasps> don't you know me? Elmer. What's the matter? Don't you want me to speak to you? No, don't speak to me, please. I'll tell you another time. Well, I... What's up? Afraid I'll ask to be introduced to your swell friend? I can't explain. I promised to see you, but I beg you not to talk to me now. Anything to oblige, of course. That's always been my motto. But is it a bargain, fair and square? You'll see me? I promise. All right, then. Call me up in the morning at the Driscoll Building on 709. Got it? Yes, Well, this is decent of you, Undine. I said I'd come. That's so, and you see, I believed you, though I might not have. I don't see the use of beginning like this. Well, that's so, too. If we're going to talk, I'd like to see your face. Would you put back your veil? I don't... Oh, why not? There's mighty few women as well worth looking at, and I'm obliged to you for letting me have the chance again. I'm glad to see you, too, Elmer. You didn't betray that fact last night, Miss Sprague. I was so taken aback. I thought you were out in Alaska. Didn't your father tell you he'd see me downtown? He never said a word about it. Well, I wish I could scare some people as easy as I scare him. I... I never felt toward you the way father did. No. And if they'd left you alone, I don't believe you'd have acted mean to me. I didn't intend to, Elmer. But I was so young... I didn't know anything. No. I don't suppose it would teach a girl much to be engaged two years to a fool like Millard Binch. I was only a child when I was engaged to Millard. Didn't the papers call you the child bride? What's the use of breaking up things that are over? Was that why you tried to cut me last night? Oh, Elmer, I didn't mean to, only... You see, I'm engaged. I saw that fast enough. (laughs) He was feeling pretty good there, sitting alongside of you, wasn't he? I don't wonder he was. I remember. 
But I don't see that was a reason for cold shouldering me. I'm a respectable member of society now. I am private secretary to Harmon B. Driscoll. Elmer Moffat, you are? <laughs> Guess you'd have remembered me last night if you'd known it. You're living in New York, then? You're going to live here right along. Well, it looks that way. As long as I can hold on to this job. Great men always gravitate to the metropolis, and I gravitated here just as Uncle Harmon was looking around for somebody who could give him an inside tip on the U-Ball mine deal. So in one way, your folks did me a good turn when they made Apex too hot for me. Funny to think of, ain't it? I'm real glad of it. I mean, I'm real glad you've had such a stroke of luck. Much obliged. Father will be real glad too, Elmer. You must see now that it was natural father and mother should have felt the way they did. I admit I wasn't a promising case in those days. Say, Undine, it was good while it lasted, though, wasn't it? Don't! Well, that ruled out, too. Look here, Undine. Suppose you let me know what you are here to talk about. Just to ask you, to beg you not to say anything of this kind again, ever. About you and me? Yes. Why? What's wrong? Anyone been saying anything against me? Well, no, it's not that. What is it, then? Except that you're ashamed of me one way or another. I don't want to break into your gilt-edged crowd if that's what you're scared of. No, no, you don't understand. All I want is that nothing shall be known. Yes, but why? It was all straight enough if you come to that. It doesn't matter whether it was straight. <whistles> What I mean is that out here in the East, they don't even like it if a girl's been engaged ah, before. Gee, how'd they expect a fair young life to pass? Playing Holy City on the Melodeon and knitting tidies for church fairs? Girls are looked after here. It's all different. Their mothers go round with them. Ha-ha, <laughs> excuse me. I ought to have remembered. Where's your chaperone, Miss Spragg? Elmer, if you really believe I never wanted to act mean to you, don't you act mean to me now. Act mean? What is it you want, Undine? Why can't you say it right out? I don't want Ralph Marvell or any of them to know anything. If his folks found out, they'd never let him marry me. Never. And he wouldn't want to. He'd be so horrified. Well, Elmer, if you ever liked me, help me now, and I'll help you if I get the chance. Is that so, puss? You just asked me to pass the sponge over Elmer Moffat of Apex City. Cut the gentleman when we meet. Is that the size of it? Elmer, it's my first chance. I can't lose it. Oh. <laughs> of course you should. Here, look up, Auntie. I never saw you cry before. Don't you be afraid of me. I ain't going to interrupt the wedding march. I only just want one little promise in return. There's nothing. I don't want to butt into your set. All I want is... If ever it should come in handy to know any of them in a business way, would you fix it up for me? After you're married? Afterward? Yes. I promise. And you promise, Elmer? All to have and to hold. Ralph. Yes, yes. You told me not to come, yet here I am, patiently waiting. I told you I'd be awfully late. I know, trying on, and you're horribly tired and wishing with all your might I wasn't here. I'm not so sure I'm not. Oh, what a tragic little voice. I couldn't help dropping in for a minute. Your mother said I might wait. Only take off your veil and let me see you. If I show myself now, you might not come back. <sighs> I look perfectly hideous. It was so hot, and they kept me so long. Oh, to make yourself more beautiful for a man who's blind with your beauty already? Oh, oh, dear, what's the matter? You've been crying. All my things were horrid, and it made me so cross and nervous. Oh, I can't bear to see you so done up. Oh, why can't we be married tomorrow and escape all these ridiculous preparations? I wish we could be married right away. Oh, dearest, dearest. Don't, if you don't mean it. The thought's too glorious. I suppose most of the things could be got ready sooner. If I said they must, and why shouldn't the rest be sent over to Europe after us? I want to go away from everything, ever so far away, where there'll be nobody but you and me alone. Oh, my darling, my darling. <laughs> So what you've come to say, Mr. Dagonet? 
is that your grandson don't make a living out of the law. Well... Uh, don't strike me, he'd be likely to from the talks I've had with him. Fact is, the law's a business that a, wants a... A profession, Mr. Sprague. It ain't a business. I guess that's the whole trouble with Ralph. Nobody expects to make money in a profession. And if you've taught him to regard the law that way, he'd better go right into cooking stoves and have done with it. It's because I knew he would manage to make cooking stoves as unremunerative as a profession that I saved him from so glaring a failure by putting him into the law. Well, what can he do, then? He can write poetry. At least, he tells me he can. And he can count on 3000 a year from me. Does it cost anything like that to print his poetry? <laughs> Dear no, he... He doesn't go in for lux editions. And now and then he gets ten dollars from a magazine. Wasn't he ever taught to work? No. I really couldn't have afforded that. Then they've got to live on two hundred and fifty dollars a month. Well, does it cost anything like that to buy your daughter's dresses? <laughs> I might put him in the way of something. I guess he's smart enough. It will pay us both in the end to keep him out of business. I don't see why. The fact is, Andy, I reckon you can do better. Better than Ralph Marvell. That's right. You better wait a while and look around again. Wait a while? Look around? Do you suppose I'm marrying for money? Well, it's a commodity you know how to get through, my girl. But it's a question of the kind of people I want to go with. Do you want me to... To marry a dentist and live in a West Side flat. I didn't say that. In New York society, getting married isn't like like getting a buggy ride. If a girl breaks an engagement to a man in Ralph Marvell's set, she ruins her chances for good. We'd better go back to Apex right off. It was you who wanted to leave there in the first place, not me. Andy, when it comes please... to that, I have always done what you and Mother wanted. But I've just about given up trying to make out what you're after. Unless it's to make me miserable. From now on, you needn't ask me where I'm going or what I'm doing, because I'll die before I tell you. And you've made my life so hateful, I only wish I was dead already. Oh, ain't you in love with this Ralph, Andy? Do you think I'd care a cent for all the rest of it if I wasn't? Well, if you are, you and he won't mind beginning in a small way. Do you suppose I'd drag him down? I'll send this ring back this minute. I'll tell him I thought he was a rich man, and now I see him mistaken. Hey, 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 hey. Shh, shh, shh. I'll see what I can do, Undine. No, don't carry on so, my lovely. you onto a good thing, Mr. Sprague. Not because I'm so fond of you, but just because it happens to hit my sense of a joke. You got five minutes, Homer. Fact is, the Driscolls are getting busy out in Apex. Now they got all the street railroads in their pocket, they want the water supply, too. Well, I'm out of that long ago. Sure, but you know what went on when you were in it. Well? Well, Representative James J. Rolliver, who was in it with you, ain't out of it yet. He's the man the Driscolls are up against. What you know about him? Driscoll tell you to come here? No, sir. Not by a good many miles. Well, I didn't either. Good morning, Mr. Moffat. Undine's to be married this summer, ain't she? You go to hell! You needn't warn me off. I, I don't want to be invited to the wedding. But I do want to get out of old Driscoll's office. There's no future there for a fellow like me. I see things big. New York's my size. I could prove it to you tomorrow if I could put my hands on $50,000. Go on. And I could put my hand on double that sum. Yes, sir, double. If you just step round with me to old Driscoll's office before 5 p.m. See the connection, Mr. Sprague? <laughs> You want me to tell Driscoll what I know about Rolliver? I want you to tell the truth. I want you to stand up for political purity in your native state. Rolliver and I always stood together. How much have you made out of that? Ain't he always been ahead of the game? No, I can't. I can't do it. Well, so long. Miss Sprague's wedding takes place soon, I hear. Monday. How's that? I saw in the papers the date was set for the end of June. I presume my daughter has her reasons for bringing it forward. 
Well, see here, I know Undine's reasons. She don't beat around the bush the way you do. She wants the Marvells to think she's right out of kindergarten. Now, I don't bear malice. Not against Undine, anyway. And if I could have afforded it, I'd have been glad enough to oblige her and forget old times. But you didn't hesitate to kick me when I was down. And now there's a kind of poetic justice in your being the man to help me up. Do you see where we're coming out? You mean to talk? I mean you to talk. To old Driscoll. It's a hundred thousand down between us. I'll see you again. No, sir, you won't. You'll only hear from me through the Marvell family. Your news ain't worth a dollar to Driscoll if you don't get it today. Oh, Mr. Sprague, about this necklace I've ordered for Undy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Elma Moffat, Ralph Marvell. I beg your pardon most awfully. Am I interrupting? No, I, I guess we're pretty nearly through. Oh, thanks so much. Oh, but haven't we met before? It seems to me I've seen you. At, Not uh, as I'm aware of, Mr. Marvell, but better late than never, eh? Oh. I'll see you at Driscoll's then, Mr. Sprague. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll see you there. Oh, and congratulations, Mr. Marvell, for your wedding on Monday. That wedding went right ahead without a hitch, and Elma Moffat made a tidy sum down to Mr. Sprague's help. It was the most high-class wedding of the season. I got columns and columns on it here. She was the prettiest bride New York ever seen. Then off they went on their honeymoon to Europe, and after a little while, the gossips forgot him. Ralph, you know it's four months today since we landed at Naples. <laughs> Are you keeping count of the days? Hasn't it simply danced past? You look as cool as a wave, my Undine. I don't feel cool. You said there'd be a breeze up here. Oh, you poor darling. Wasn't it ever this hot in Apex? Yes, but I didn't marry you to go back to Apex. <sighs> I wonder what you did marry me for, Mrs. Marvell. Mercy, it's too hot for conundrums. Oh, do you really mind the heat so much? We'll go if you do. Go to Paris, you mean? Well, I hadn't taken quite as long a leap. I only mean we might drive back to Siena. Oh, Siena's hotter than this. Oh, we could go sit in the cathedral. It's always cool in there at sunset. We sat in the cathedral every day for a week, Ralph. Well, what do you say to stopping at Lucetto on the way? The drive back by moonlight would be glorious. But where would we get anything to eat? <laughs> You're too practical. Somebody's got to be. And the food in the hotel is too disgusting if we're not on time. If you're tired of Italy, we've got all the world to choose from. But Paris, well, Paris will be expensive. Don't people generally come here earlier in the year? Yes, that's why I chose the summer, so that we could have it all to ourselves. If you'd told me we were going everywhere at the wrong time, I could have arranged about my clothes. Oh, my poor Undine. Let us by all means go to the place where the clothes will be right. They're too beautiful to be left out of our scheme of life. I know you don't care how I look, but you didn't give me time to order anything before we were married, and I've got nothing but my last winter's things to wear. Well, go where you please, anywhere. Listen, do you know what I saw last night? A wonderful thing. I wish you'd stayed up to see it, too. At the hotel? When I went for a breath of air, a vision. It came to me with the moonrise. A vision? I've never cared much about spirits. Mother used to try to drag me to seances, but they always made me sleepy. Uh, no. I saw... The vision of the book I mean to do. It came to me magnificently, swooped down on me as that big white moon swooped down on the black landscape. You're not going to write a book here. No, the point is that it's come to me. All these months together, all our happiness, it's the meaning of life I've found, and it's you, dearest, who've given it to me. <laughs> oh. Oh. Undine, what? what's the matter? Nothing. I don't know. I, I suppose I'm homesick. Oh, homesick. Oh, you poor darling. You're tired of traveling. But I don't like Italy. It's not what I expected. And I think it's all too dreadfully dreary. Oh, but why? It's dirty and ugly. All the towns we've been to are so old. I'm sick and tired of stuffy hotel rooms and the smells and the beggars. New York's much nicer. <laughs> Surely not New York in July. There are roof gardens. And there are always people around. 
All these places seem as if they were dead. It's like some awful cemetery. Oh, don't <laughs> cry, dear. You're lonely and the heat has tired you out. We'll move on. To Paris? We'll go just where you want. How soon can you be ready to start? Tomorrow. First thing, I'll make Celeste pack as soon as we get back to the hotel. Oh, Ralph, it's sweet of you. And I love you. The darling little jeweler's shop's here. I'm just going to pop in for a moment, Ralphie. You could wait for me in the cafe. You want to buy jewels? But my poor girl. Of course not. How silly you are. I only wanted this old thing reset. The sapphires? My mother's ring? I'd rather you didn't, Andy. It's so old-fashioned. Well, they've been in the family for... Well, you see, it's not that I don't want you to do this or that, but for the moment, we're rather strapped and with the dresses. I told you, the advantage of going to the French dressmakers is that they'll wait twice as long for their money as the people at home. And you ought to see how I've beaten them down. Have you any idea what a dinner dress costs in New York? Well, I knew you'd have your book. I've been having tea at the locks with Bertha Shalom, and you'll never guess who we met. Peter Van Dagen. I've had a cable from your father, Andy. What is it? He's lost some money in the city, and he won't be able to send us anything for three months. Three months? It's a hard knock for him. I'm sorry. But Paris is the first place in Europe that I've liked. I'm awfully sorry, dearest. It's my fault for persuading you to marry a pauper. It's father's fault. Why on earth did he go and speculate? Couldn't your people do something, Ralph? Help us out just this once, I mean. Undine, my grandfather does as much as he can for me. And my mother has nothing but what he gives her. He doesn't give us nearly as much as father does. Couldn't you ask your sister, then? I must have some clothes to go home in. Whatever happens, we do have to book a steamer home, while we still have the money to pay our fare. Ah, now that's where I have been clever... You always think me so extravagant, but I've saved you the price of our passage. <laughs> How did you do it? By countermanding a tiara? Do you know Peter Van Dagen has come over on his own private steam yacht? Well, I've made him ask us to go home on it with him. You made him? I worked him round to it. He's crazy about the idea now, but I don't think he'd thought of it before. I should say not. He never would have had the cheek. Did you ever know such luck? Do you suppose I'll let you cross the ocean on that boat? You say that because your cousin doesn't go on her. Because it's no place for decent women. It's Claire's fault if it isn't. Everyone knows she's crazy about you. That's why he takes up with other women. Oh, is that the precious stuff he tells you? Do you suppose I had to wait for him to tell me? Everybody knows it. Everybody in New York knew she was wild when you married. That's why she's always been so nasty to me. Oh, is that... Don't let's pay Peter the compliment of squabbling over him. You refuse, then? To travel with Peter's chorus girls? They won't be on board with us, I suppose. Undine, I have the tickets. We sail on Saturday. Undine? Oh, my poor girl, what's the matter? Oh, what's wrong, dear? Oh, what's happened? Tell me, please. Why are you staring at me like that? Anybody can see what's the matter. Why don't... Undine? I'm pregnant. <laughs> are you as sorry as all that? Sorry. Sorry, oh, I'm... Undine, by and by you'll feel differently. I know you would. Oh, when? In a year? It takes a year. A whole year out of life. What do I care how I shall feel in a year? Well, don't you think you may be mistaken, dear? How on earth can I be mistaken? Well, that's all you feel, then? That's all? What else do you expect me to feel? They feel horribly ill, if that's what you want. Oh, poor dear, poor girl. I'm so dreadfully sorry. You're sorry? Why? What earthly difference will it make to you? You won't hate yourself more and more every morning when you get up and see yourself in the glass. And just as I've been to the bother of ordering all those dresses, just as I thought it was going home to have a little pleasure after all our worries, <laughs> for all the good this rubbish will do me now, I loathe the very sight of it. <laughs> Uh, 
Undine and Ralph sailed back to New York, and Mr. Sprague took a good little house for them down the West End. But it weren't in the smartest area, and that rankled with Undie. She hid herself away for nigh on two years, until she got her looks back and could go about again, leaving Baby with his nurse. The trouble was money. Even after Ralph left the law and tried to go into business, they was never flush. Undie enjoyed herself as best she could, and she always did have the smartest dresses and the best accessories, but, oh my, she had to plot and use every ounce of her cunning to make sure of getting what a girl like her needed and deserved. Well, Popple, it's damn good. Best portrait I've seen this year. You've hit her hair ripplingly. Mrs. Marvell is a rewarding subject piece. She doesn't look a day over 17. Well, happily, in this case, there has been no need to idealize. Nature herself has outdone the artist's dream. No one would believe she's got a two-year-old son. No, Pop, you're right enough. A painter would be hard put to improve upon her looks. Yes, mere flesh and blood she is. Stunning. But personally, I prefer your wife's type. Mrs. Van Dagen's breeding shines through. Keep your preferences to yourself, eh, Popple? <laughs> I speak as an artist, not a man, Peter. The artist sees the true essence of the woman. And it's a point of honor with the man to steel himself against the personal seduction. <laughs> Mr. Popple, they're asking for you in the other room. Something about the cocktail. <laughs> Excuse me. Do you like it? It's a beauty. Only the pearls ain't big enough. Of course they're not. But it's not his fault, poor man. He didn't give them to me. He might, then, for the privilege of painting you. The privilege? Mercy, I have to pay for being painted. He'll tell you he's giving me the picture, but what do you suppose that dress costs? Does the price come higher than the neckline? Of course, what they charge for is the cut. What they cut away? Don't tease, Peter. I'm tired now. He's had me posing all afternoon. Are you off, then? Yes, back to West End Avenue. If I can find a cab to take me out there in the snow. Of course you won't get a cab on an evening like this. You'd better jump in the open car with me. You're not afraid of being seen with me, are you? Got anything you can put over your head? Will that lace thing do? Good. What's the matter? Isn't everything all right? It's nothing. No, it's not. You're perfectly pale and sad. What's up there, cousin? Oh, I don't know. I'm just so tired of the stupid bothers about money. Money? Why do you have to puzzle that pretty head over money? Well, you know as well as I do how little Ralph earns. Where is he now? State agents? Chap with as much class as Ralph wasn't cut out for the world of work. The Driscoll's fancy dress ball is coming up, and I want to go as the Empress Josephine. <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to miss the sight of that, but Driscoll's ball ain't too likely. Old Driscoll's high and dry. They've lost their money? Won't they give their fancy ball then? That Elmer Moffat reckons he's going to dress old Driscoll in stripes. Elmer Moffat? He's a cool enough customer to take on all Wall Street. Look here, Andy. I'll throw a fancy dress ball for you. <laughs> it's sweet of you, Peter, but I still have my dressmaker to wrangle with. The tradespeople are pestering me at every turn. Hang that! Would a couple of thousand make it all right? Oh, it would make everything so much easier. If you're quite sure... Not another word. Everything jolly again now? <laughs> Perfectly. Thank you. You should see about moving uptown instead of living out here in the Mercy. sticks. Mercy! It's the boy's birthday. I was to take him to his grandmother's. I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Laura, hello. I'm so sorry. It's outrageous of me to be so late. I daren't look my son in the face. Don't tell me the party's over and the guests of honor gone to bed. Sit down, Ralph. You look tired. I'll give you some tea. I had to finish at the office. It was rather a rush. Hello. What a jolly cake. But it hasn't been cut. Come and have your tea first. Oh, no, no. Okay. Tea afterwards, thanks. Are they all upstairs with my grandfather? I must make my peace with Undine. Undine didn't come. But who brought the boy, then? He didn't come either. That's why the cake's not cut. Is he ill? Paul's all right. Apparently Undine forgot. She never went home for him, and the nurse waited till it was too late to come. Poor little Paul. Poor chap. Yes, please. Some tea. Oh. 
But this won't do. I must see Mother and Grandfather. I must apologize. Grandfather's taking his nap. Mother had to dash out for a committee meeting. She left as soon as she heard Paul wasn't coming. I see. Yes, make the tea strong, please. I've had a beastly fagging sort of day. Claire called. She left Paul a present. That's kind of her. She said she saw Undine at Popple's. She said... Ah, the famous portrait. In Popple's society, who wouldn't forget the flight of time? She said you shouldn't let Peter make a goose of your wife. She... (laughs) Well, that's good. Oh, Ralph. I hate to see you like this. I don't understand you. First you let Claire marry Peter. Let? Laura, this is old business. Claire made her own choice. I went to Spain for a summer, and when I came back, she'd engaged herself to Peter. But Undine... Stop it. Not a word. But how can you expect Mother and me to stand by and watch her using you, wearing you out, demanding... Laura, I mean it. I should go home and say happy birthday to the poor little fellow before he goes to bed. I don't care, Ralph. I shall say one more thing. Have you seen what she's done to Mother's ring? The wedding ring you gave her. Oh, the sapphires? Oh, I... I can't say I've... I was sitting next to her the other night, and she laid her hand on the table. It's been reset. And those beautiful old stones look as cheap and out of place Laura, as... I'm going. I'm sorry, Ralph. I'm so sorry. the nurse take him? You said you were coming to fetch him, so she waited. But I telephoned. Where from? Popple's studio, of course. The sitting lasted longer than usual. I thought he was giving a tea. He had tea afterward. He always does. And he asked some people in to see my portrait. When they turned up, I couldn't rush away. It would have looked as if I didn't like the picture. The nurse didn't get any message. My people were awfully disappointed, and the poor boy has cried his eyes out. Oh, dear me. What a fuss. But I might have known my message wouldn't be delivered. Everything always happens to put me in the wrong with your family. You've just come from the studio? Yes, I must go and change. We're dining at the Ellings. How did you come? In a cab? No, I couldn't find one, so Peter gave me a lift like an angel. I'm blown to bits. He had his open car. Is that all? At dinner that night, Undie shined her brightest. When they got home, Ralph locked up and put out the lights. And when he went upstairs, he found her waiting for him on the landing. Her cloak dropped from her white shoulders, lovely as a picture. Ralphie. Good night, Undine. Won't be like that. How the devil is it that you get more beautiful with every day that passes, Mrs. Marvell? Oh, Peter. In my line of business, when a chap lays out money, he generally expects some return, you know. What on earth kind of return do you... Don't play the ingenue with me, Undine. The installment plan's all right, but ain't you a bit behind even on that? You can't think... Well, I'll let the interest accumulate. This is goodbye till I get back from Europe. Europe? When are you sailing? The 1st of April. A good day for a fool to acknowledge his folly. Peter, I shan't see you again. Oh, you'll turn up in Paris later, I suppose, to get your summer wardrobe. (laughs) When Ralph can get away, the furthest we shall go is to the Adirondacks for the boy. I shan't need Paris clothes there. It doesn't matter at any rate, because nobody I care about will see me. (laughs) That's a little rough on Ralph. I oughtn't to have said it, ought I? But the fact is, I'm unhappy... And a little hurt. What's wrong? I thought you'd be sorrier to leave me, Peter. Well, it needn't be for long. It's damnable the way you're tied down. You oughtn't to be bound for life by a girl's mistake. Aren't we all bound by our mistakes, we women? Can't you coax your mother to run over to Paris with you? Ralph couldn't object to that. I don't believe Father could afford it. It would all be so easy if you'd only be a little fond of me. We women can't repair our mistakes. Nonsense. There's nothing cash won't do. Why won't you let me straighten things out for you? You seem to forget that I am married. (sighs) That, well, so am I. 
Well, Undy, I might have guessed you weren't just popping in to give me the time of day. I wish you'd understand that I'm serious, Father. I've never been strong since Paul was born, and I need a change. And there are other reasons for my wanting to go to Paris. Well, I never knew you short of reasons, Undy. Trouble is, you don't always know other people's when you see them. I know your reasons. I've heard them often enough. But you can't know mine because I haven't told you. Not the real ones. More bills? No. I'm unhappy at home. Unhappy? Why, he worships the ground you walk on. That's not always a reason for a woman... It isn't a reason, isn't it? I seem to remember the time when you used to think it was equal to a whole carload of whitewash. My marriage was a mistake from the beginning. His people hate me. They've never forgiven me for his having had to go into business. Of course, it's all right for you to do it, because you're not a Marvel or a Dagonet. I suppose the old man was right. He hasn't got it in him to make money. Of course not. He wasn't brought up to it. He told me it was killing a little more of him every day. Do they back him up in that kind of talk? They back him up in everything. Can't you guess how they treat me from the way they've acted to you and Mother? Oh, you never so much as set eyes on them. That's just what I mean. Why do you suppose they never invite you to dine? They're ashamed Ralph married an Apex girl. Oh, if you came from Apex, your income came from there, too. I presume they'd be sorry if Ralph was left to support you on his. They're willing enough he should take your money. That's only natural, they think. <laughs> uh, there seems to be practical unanimity on that point. But I don't see how going to Europe is going to help you out. If I can get away soon, go straight over to Paris, there's someone there who'd do anything if I was free. <laughs> Are you sitting there in your sane senses and talking to me of what you could do if you were free? If I were free, I could marry the right man. The right man? The right man? I, I, haven't you had enough of trying for him yet? I agree. With Mrs. Marvell. Alma... You thought Father and I were quarreling, but we never quarrel anymore. He always agrees with me. I wish that treaty had been signed a few years sooner. You were more beautiful than ever, Mrs. Marvell. I've already given you my reply, Mr. Moffat. There'll be a handsome profit in it for you. No, sir. That's fine. Well, that's put me in my place, eh, Mrs. Marvell? I won't intrude on you any longer. Good day, Mr. Sprague. What did he want? Uh, just another of his wildcat schemes. Some real estate deal he's in. Why did he come to you about it? Well, he'd ring the devil's front doorbell if he thought he could get anything out of him. Father, I did what you wanted. That one time, anyhow. Won't you listen to me and help me out now? Who is it you've got your eye on this time? Whose pockets are deep enough for you, Undy? Peter Van Dagen. He's going to Paris next week, and if I could just... He's married. Yes, but he and Claire hardly ever go about together. She won't be in Paris. And neither will you. For Lord's sake, girl. Ralph's a decent man. He don't drink, he don't chase women. If you think I can it's any daughter of mine getting a divorce for a whim, and so as she can smash up someone else's marriage, the too... The father! Never! Never while I have the power to prevent it. Mrs. Marvell, I've been waiting to say a word to you. I'm afraid I can't stop. If you'd rather have me call around at your house. What is it you wanted to say, Elmer? You recall that little walk we had in the park before you was married? Where we each made a promise? I should say as I've kept my side of the bargain. Yes, of course. And now I should like you to keep yours and introduce me to someone in your set. Who? Your husband. Ralph. What can he do for you? There's a piece of real estate in the city which has been left to a couple of heirs who are wrangling over it, and I've got a party interested to buy. Ralph's firm represents the heirs, but it'd be better to work the deal, you know, through social channels. If I could have a quiet chat with your husband, he'd soon see the benefit. Benefit? If the deal goes through, there'll be a commission of $40,000, and a fourth of that would go to Ralph. Jove, that's an amazing fellow. Has he gone? Elmer Moffat, Esquire. He has. Where was it you ran across him? Out at Apex? Yes, years ago. Father had some business with him and brought him home to dinner one day. And you've never seen him since? I suppose I must have. 
But that all seems so long ago. I wish I could put him in a book. There's something epic about him. The kind of man who needs a big field and perhaps makes some big mistakes, but gets where he wants to in the end. What did he want to talk about? Oh, property. There'd be a big commission if I could help him. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Why do you say that? I know. I've been a disappointment as a moneymaker. I really don't care. What's the matter? Don't you feel well? I'm a little tired. It's nothing. <laughs> oh, what is it, dear? Do you seem to think I'm too selfish and odious? That I'm just pretending to be ill? No, no. I saw the doctor. I was trying to save you from the worry. What did he say? I have nervous exhaustion. He says I need a change of scene. You need... I have to tone up my nervous system. He says I should run over to Paris for a few weeks. <laughs> but, but we can't afford it. <laughs> oh, Andy, my dearest. I'll see Moffat again. I'll get you the money. <laughs> 